Hello and welcome to our Seven Days of Science Christmas special, coming straight from the North Pole. We've had the entire set transported here, but unfortunately that took all of our budget, so I don't have enough for a Santa hat. We could also only afford to pay for a one-way ticket, so I'm not entirely sure how we're going to get this set back for next week. <laughs> I hope everyone's having a fantastic Christmas, but I bet you're all wondering what you're going to do with all your Christmas money. What goodies are you going to get and what scientific wonders will you cover? Well, perhaps you could be tempted by Curiosity Box, who have made this video possible here in the North Pole. Check out our Ancient Americans with Specialist Mammoth Killers video to see Ben, Amelia and myself unbox the Winter Box and fawn all over the stuff inside. Remember to use our affiliate link below and our special promo code FOSSIL for a very special deal. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society Letters has hypothesised that dark energy doesn't exist. At the moment, it is commonly thought that dark energy makes up about two-thirds of the mass energy density of the entire universe, but there is very little known about it. The reason it is thought to exist is that without it, the universe's expansion should not be accelerating, but by most calculations, it is. Dark energy is thought to have some kind of anti-gravity effect that pushes the universe further and further apart instead of bringing it together. Researchers in the past have disputed this idea, and some pieces of cutting-edge knowledge seem to suggest it might not quite be as originally imagined. Some have even suggested that dark energy is somehow evolving over time and is not a constant force. The researchers who wrote this particular paper claim that the universe is not, as has usually been assumed, expanding at a uniform rate. Instead, they say the universe is lumpy and propose that the way we calibrate time and distance is currently wrong. Their evidence challenges the current standard cosmological model, the lambda cold dark matter model. Instead, the researchers favour timescape cosmology, the idea that the universe is home to huge cosmic voids that affect the way we calculate time and distance. This idea has been around for years. The idea of a lumpy universe is not new, but it doesn't really have enough evidence to support a wholehearted departure from the Lambda CDM model. This study might just be the beginning of a change in that thinking. It has analysed supernovae light curves using modern data to come to their conclusion, but they know it is not enough to prove that the Lambda CDM model is wrong and should instead be replaced with a timescape alternative that would mean that the universe does not expand in a uniform way. Luckily for us, ESA's new Euclid satellite launched in the summer of 2023 has the power to gather the evidence needed, but unluckily for us, this would require high quality observations of at least 1,000 supernovae. So we're not quite at a scientific revolution with this paper, but it puts ever more importance on Euclid's mission to discover more about dark matter and dark energy. Perhaps it might just lead to the discovery that there is no dark energy at all. In other news, NASA's Parker Solar Probe is going to dive in for its closest flyby of the sun yet at 5am GMT on the 28th of December. We've actually reported on the Parker Solar Probe a couple of times in Seven Days of Science as it got closer and closer to the Sun. Three years ago, in our 2021 Seven Days of Science Christmas special, the probe technically touched the Sun, entering the very upper parts of the Sun's atmosphere, the corona. On the 28th, the probe will get even closer to the surface of the Sun than before. Because of the nature of orbital physics, the probe gets faster as it reaches the lowest point of its orbit, the perihelion. Because the Sun is the most massive thing a human-made object has orbited, this means that the Parker Solar Probe will break its own record for the fastest ever human-made object, reaching a rather fast 430,000 miles per hour as it plunges into the corona. The corona itself is a bit of an unknown aspect of our star to scientists, as it reaches a heat many, many times greater than that on the Sun's surface, a fact that scientists can't quite understand yet. Hopefully, the data that the Parker Solar Probe will gather this Saturday will at least go some way in helping to answer that question. There's been some drama in the world of dinosaur paleontology as a paper has just been published arguing that the giant allosaur species Saurophaganax maximus is 
In fact, not a theropod dinosaur at all. And this paper also names a new species of Allosaurus itself. The paleontologists re-examined the fossils named as Sauroforganax, which come from the late Jurassic aged Morrison formation in Oklahoma. Sauroforganax was originally thought to be a particularly enormous Allosaurus relative that coexisted in the same environment with this iconic predator. However, looking at the fossils, they found that some of the bones are actually probably from a long-necked sauropod dinosaur, not a giant allosaurid. In addition, some of the other sauroforganax bones are actually from some kind of allosaurid. So, confusingly, there seem to have been at least a couple of different animals that got mixed up together and considered to be the same species. To attempt to solve this problem, the scientists say that the name Sauroforganax maximus should be used for a species of currently undiagnosed sauropod, while the actual allosaurid material is argued to represent a new, particularly large species of Allosaurus, which they name Allosaurus anax, with anax coming from the Greek king. Allosaurus anax is therefore only known from fragmentary remains, but seems to have enough distinct features on the bones to be recognised as different from the other Allosaurus species. Hopefully, we'll get some much more complete fossils of this big Allosaurus in the future, and a proper diagnosis of the Sauroforganax sauropod too. So, goodbye Sauroforganax, and hello to the Allosaurus king. Up next in the news, a new species of dinosaur has just been named based on a fossil found in China. It's only known from a single upper leg bone, but scientists identified enough diagnostic features of the bone to name it as the new species Archaeocursor asiaticus. It would have come from a rather small dinosaur, an estimated 1 meter or 3.3 feet in total body length. Very interestingly, this is now the oldest member of the major lineage of dinosaurs known as the Ornithischians that's been found in all of Asia so far. The Ornithischians include lots of famous groups of dinosaurs such as the Horned Ceratopsians, the Armoured Stegosaurs and Ankylosaurs, the Crested Hadrosaurs and many others. Since Archaeocursor was uncovered from the very early Jurassic Age rocks in China, it seems to indicate that a very early dispersal of these dinosaurs occurred between the southern ancient landmass of Gondwana into the more northern Laurasia, which China was a part of at this time. Other very old ornithischians are known from Gondwana, and Archaeocursor shows some anatomical similarities with these dinosaurs, hinting at the existence of this previously unknown dinosaur dispersal. So, quite an intriguing study, indicating that there's still lots to learn about the early evolution of this lineage. Also in the recent news, a new paper has resurrected the prehistoric pteroduck Diatrima. Well, not literally resurrected, but rather it argues that we can use this name again. Diatrima was a name that was used for some species of very large waterfowl relatives that lived between 60 to 45 million years ago. These intimidating birds were, fortunately, herbivorous, and the largest of them would have stood an estimated 2 metres or 6 foot 7 inches tall. The name Diatrima fell out of use after it was realised that the name Gastornis actually took priority over these fossils. So, for many years, this has been what they've been called. But this new research has reanalyzed some Gastornis remains and argued that two species from Europe and one from North America can in fact be distinguished from other species of Gastornis. So basically, Diatrima as a name is now resurrected and applied to these three species, including the largest known species, which is now called Diatrima giganteus. The authors argue that lumping all these pterodactyl specimens under the name Gastornis was obscuring the true diversity of these birds, and that splitting some of them into Diatrima is a much better representation of the differences between these fascinating animals. So the good news is that all of those old paleontology books labelling things as Diatrima are now no longer inaccurate. That's the magic of taxonomy. Next up, scientists have been asking the question, could you outrun an Australopithecus? I've always wondered this, and now we finally have an answer. Yes, quite easily, actually. By creating a digital 3D reconstruction of the skeleton and muscles of Australopithecus afarensis, a prehistoric relative of humans that lived between about four and three million years ago, researchers were able to test how these hominins would have performed while running. 
This species, which is the one that the famous Lucy specimen belongs to, was indeed capable of running bipedally, but would have been much slower than a modern human. The proportions of the Australopithecus body seem to have been the main limiting factor on their speed, since they were still rather slow even when the digital models were given beefed up muscles. These findings therefore add more support to the idea that certain features of the modern human body, particularly our overall proportions, are adaptations specifically for improved running abilities rather than just enhanced walking capabilities. A very interesting study indeed. Well, that's it from us this week. I do hope you have a very Merry Christmas. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to leave us a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And also, go and tell all of your friends how amazing Seven Days of Science is. Have a great week. And as always, we'll see you on Sunday. A special thank you to all our supporters on Patreon, including Corey Peterson, Andrew Coam, Giotist, Clara Middleton, Drove Srivastava, Gary Arrington, Lena Rose, Medicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Thomas, Sammy Voss, Thanaforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Timothy N. Tedro, and Troy Schmidt. Thank you for your continued support, and we look forward to getting the next monthly roundup to you soon.